this is an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, again, please uh, welcome to the UU Forum, Mayor James. Good morning, everybody. Get my iPad ready here. Um, I want to first of all thank Michael, uh, a man that I have had the privilege of working with for quite some time. Before I ran for mayor, I served on the Land Clearance for Redevelopment Authority, uh, where Michael was the chair. Uh, the job of the LCRA was to find uses for land and to determine um, the distribution of tax abatements, mostly for housing uh, in the city. And uh, I learned a lot working with Michael. Uh, I think at the time that I joined the LCRA, Michael had been there since uh, George Washington. Um, <laughs> And there was no one that I knew who knew more about the workings of housing in the city than Michael Duffy. Uh, he's been a good man in his work with the legal aid um, uh, organization has been stellar as well. Uh, so I come to, come to you uh, at his initial request. He was the first person who reached out to me eight years ago uh, to do this. And so now I'm here in my final appearance as the mayor of this city that I love. And uh, I want to recognize that for 150 years, uh, this community has gathered uh, to share a commitment to social justice. So I think it's fitting that I come here today during the weekend that we celebrate the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I really can't think of a better place or a better time to join with your community in determining and talking about how we are working to make Kansas City a more just and equitable place for every resident. Uh, we've made some good progress in our commitment to serve our neighbors and our community and most importantly our children. But and, I, and I'm proud of that progress, and I'm proud of all those who've worked so hard to make the progress possible and a reality. But we also have to understand that there is much, much, much more work left to be done. Uh, one year before his death, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, said, uh, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today, and we're confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. So in spite of all the great progress that, and momentum that we've enjoyed here in Kansas City and are currently enjoying in Kansas City, and the things that we have seen blossom over, over recent years, uh, we have been too late in fulfilling our obligation to the community and as a community uh, to adequately prepare all all of our children for the future. We realize that we've been too late when we hear news of yet another homicide, where we read stories of shortages of skilled workers, where we learn that so many in our community are living in poverty, barely making ends meet. Many of those stories would be different if we had greater equity throughout our community. Your earning potential, your level of education, health, even life expectancy, shouldn't depend on what zip code you live in or what color your skin is, but for generations, that's exactly what's happened in our city. In 2017, black students made up 42% uh, 42 of the Kansas City, Missouri third grade population. All else being equal, we would expect a proportionate number of black students in the third grade to represent a third grade reading population that scored either proficient or advanced in their reading skills. However, black students made up only 27% of proficient or advanced readers in third grade. The same disparity is true for our Hispanic students. And while Hispanics, Hispanic students fare better generally, their proficient population is still not proportional to their enrollment population. Meanwhile, 39% of third graders were white students and 57% of those students are reading proficiently. 
The issue of third grade reading proficiency is a pivotal and important marker in a child's education. Research shows that up to third grade, you are learning to read, and from third grade on, you're reading to learn. So if you're not reading proficiently by the time that you are in and completing third grade, it's going to be harder and harder to close that gap going forward as you reach higher grade levels in grade school and to head towards high school. And what's the one thing that we all wanted to be when we were in high school? We wanted to be just like every other high school kid. We did not want to stand out. And when you can't read, you stand out. And when you can't, and when you stand out for those types of reasons, you often have acting out and other issues that accompany that. So in 2011, we started Turn to Page KC to address the third grade reading issue. And I'm proud to say that third grade reading proficiency among students in Kansas City has risen from 33% to 55% generally. Now that's done by having a collective impact model, working with all sorts of other organizations collectively and focused on the issue of third grade reading. But in process of being focused on the issue of third grade reading, we also have to be focused on the issue of kindergarten readiness and all the other things that feed into it. It's good progress, but there's a lot more work to be done. The truth is, much of a child's success in third grade depends on their readiness to start kindergarten. And a lot of times people, I think, think that kindergarten means you show up with the big 64 box of crayons and, and you haven't used them. It's got the little sharpener on the side. You can sharpen them up. You've got your shoes. They're often Velcro because the Lord knows you might not know how to tie them. And some sort of a card or piece of paper in your backpack or someplace that has your name and address on it. No, it ain't like that. Kindergarten has a curriculum. You go to kindergarten to learn, not to play. It's not recess time. You're there to learn. And if you aren't ready for kindergarten, you already start behind. Right now, we have um, a problem with kindergarten readiness. Fully less than 35% of our kids show up for kindergarten ready. And as a direct result of that, I'm sorry, one of the problems in leading to that is, is that they live in an area of this country where pre-K, quality pre-K, is not readily available to all. Right now we have about 6,800 four-year-olds here in Kansas City. Only about 35% of those four-year-olds are enrolled in a high-quality pre-K program. That's about 2,300 kids who have started the right way towards kindergarten. Those 2,300 four-year-olds have started on their way to a 31% greater chance of graduating from high school. They're, far, or they're being far less likely to get into trouble with the law and end up incarcerated, where, believe it or not, a lot of people in prison have a fourth grade reading level. They're started on their way to being 80% more likely to attend college. They're started on their way to being far more likely to be employed at higher earning levels throughout their entire life. Just by virtue of attending a high-quality pre-K program, these young children have already started on their way to becoming the kind of citizen that we want in this city, and the ones that we need in order to maintain the economy, the ones that we need in order to make sure that we have educated people picking out our nursing homes. But now, what about all the others who aren't in those pre-Ks? That other 4,500 four-year-olds who are out there who don't attend a quality pre-K program year after year after year. Nearly two-thirds of our four-year-olds don't receive a high-quality pre-K education for two primary reasons. Number one is accessibility, and the other is affordability. Forty percent of the families with four-year-olds don't have access to quality pre-K programs in their neighborhoods. We have 40 percent of our zip codes that have no high quality pre-K program in them. That's almost half of the city. Nearly 60% of Hispanic families in Kansas City live in a child care desert, despite the fact that Hispanics are only 10% of the city's population. It's not, it's not for a lack of demand, it's simply that there aren't enough seats available. We have about 2,400 eligible, eligible children for about 1,000 openings in Head Start's program. 
And on top of that, the cost of quality pre-K puts pre-K out of reach for most middle and low income families. The estimated annual cost of full day, year long pre-K, high quality pre-K for one child is $12,000 a year. And with the median income of the city being about $47,489, 12,000 after tax dollars a year is pretty high. It's almost impossible. And, and let me also tell you that the all laws of economics still work. There's high demand, there's low supply, the cost goes up. One of the women in my office who has her child in a high quality pre-K and isn't making a whole lot more money than that 48,000, her $12,000 pre-K bill just went to 14. It's that much of a problem. It's not feasible for many families to be able to pay those amounts, carry that burden. So what do we do? Some tell us that we need to wait for the state to do it. Well, I can tell you that if we're gonna wait for the state and Jefferson City politicians to wake up and do what's right for Kansas City kids, then you may as well just go ahead and stay asleep because that's not gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. Not only do they not show the will to do it, they don't necessarily even have the means to do it. They've cut corporate taxes, but now they're facing a 420 some odd million dollar hole in the budget and they're trying to find money for infrastructure. And every year, they, it seems, they cut higher education costs. So they take money from education in order to do the things that they should be doing. They're not gonna put any more in high quality pre-K. I have had conversations with the governor and the governor likes the idea of quality pre-K. And he says that if he is able and what he'd like to do, maybe if the legislature might go along, is to find $60 million for the entire state. $60 million for the entire state might buy each of those kids a cookie or a lunch, but it's not gonna put them in pre-K. Compared to other states that fund early childhood education, Missouri ranks second to last in terms of the numbers of four-year-olds that are served by state-funded programs. So should we just cross our fingers and hope things get better? How long do we wait for that? Another five, another 10, another 20 years, another generation? Shall we just continue to turn out the same things that we've been doing, do the same things over and over and pray for a different result? We can go to the city and we can lay an overlay of where we have seen traditional low educational attainment and high poverty and high crime. And what, lo and behold, it's in the same place. When you hear about people committing murders in the city, I don't hear of a single one of them that's had a PhD or, or a master's degree standing on a street corner shooting at people in cars. But we do hear about people who have no options in their life, who are poverty stricken and who have been hopeless for some time and simply don't care about their life or yours. If we wait, Another 10 years, that means we'll have another 45,000 children who've gone without high quality pre-K and the things that high quality pre-K could teach them. Waiting another 10 years means we have another 45,000 kids who've missed out on the benefits of high quality edu uh, early education. Education that would have taught them the fundamentals of conflict resolution, classroom habits, learning how to get along with people who don't look like you, who don't have the same gender as you, who come from different backgrounds as you. Closing the gap that started when they were three, if you were poor, if you were poor and three, you are hearing 30 million words less than your counterpart in middle-class circumstances by the age of three, 30 million words. What we should be doing and what we do not have the will to do is we should be educating pregnant mothers and fathers about brain development of their children. And we should have a program in every hospital where every pregnant mother and father taking a baby home leaves with knowledge, materials, and a follow-up appointment 
to talk about brain development and the things that are necessary to develop a child into the type of person that we all want that child to be. But we don't do that. So if we don't do that, maybe we should go back to the robust program that we used to have of parents as teachers where an adult would show up at your house and talk to you and help you talk about the issues regarding your kids. I'll cut all the money out of that. That doesn't happen very often. Or maybe we can catch them at the age of three and start talking to them. Yeah, we do some of that, but it's limited, very limited. So we know that a child's brain is 85% developed by the time they hit age five and ready for pre-K or for kindergarten, but we don't do much to prepare them for kindergarten. And we don't do much while their brain is developing. Now, I understand that in a lot of households, it is not uncommon to walk around with the granddaughter or grandson or the baby on your hip and talking to them and cooling with them and introducing them, but that doesn't happen nearly as much as you might think. For a lot of different reasons, and it's not always the fault of the parents. Sometimes you are who you learn to be. And if you weren't taught, then you can't teach. Education is the leveling factor in a lot of things in this life. What we're doing now isn't just, and it's not equitable. Year after year, we continue to fail thousands of children in this city before they can even get their own shoes on, before they've learned how to count, before they've learned your address, their phone number, who to contact in an emergency. And we really do have to stop. I am never in favor, and I have never been the type of person to see a problem and sit around and wring my hands and hope that somebody will figure it out. I don't think that's what we're doing in this city anymore. We've shown time and time again that we're willing to do the things that are necessary for us to produce the city that we want to live in and the city that we want to raise our kids in. So we can't shake our heads while accepting the status quo and not when we can work towards a solution. So tomorrow is today, and this is the fierce urgency of now. So we've been working with a broad coalition of stakeholders, including parents, providers, educators, school and civic leaders, and I'm proposing an initiative that will appear on the April ballot that will ensure that every four-year-old in Kansas City has access to quality pre-K. We're gonna create and support a high quality pre-K program that focuses on three building blocks of school readiness. Self-regulation, social expression, and kindergarten academics, as well as motor skills, which are the foundations for all those building blocks. This investment will allow us to close the school readiness gap to ensure that there are no differences in a child's outcomes based strictly on race, ethnicity, income, or zip code. We'll support providers who are out there now to ensure all pre-K students in Kansas City receive developmentally appropriate opportunities and instruction so that they may grow cognitively, socially, emotionally, and physically. We'll cultivate an early childhood education workforce, the teachers. We'll have diversity. We'll try to pay them what they should be paid, not what they are being paid. And we'll bring them from the communities that they represent to help teach the kids in those communities. But above all, we're gonna make high quality pre-K accessible to all four-year-olds in Kansas City. Now, the way that we're gonna do that, and as a community that believes in social justice and as citizens who love this city, we wanna see it continue to thrive and we have to step up and do this for our children and for the future of the city. State's not going to do it. Nobody's going to come in on a white horse and save us. Less than two years ago, the state's Department of Revenue said that they had tax revenue that was down $425 million from the same date one year ago. They're going to have to find a way to fill that hole, and it's not going to be by funding high-quality pre-K across this state. I think we owe it to our kids and we owe it to their kids to do what we can while we have this opportunity. 
When we were competing for the Amazon HQ program, whether we liked the idea fundamentally or not, the basic issue is, or the basic thing that came out of that is, we learned a lot about our city and what our good qualities were and what our deficits are. And the first thing that we learned, and the most important thing that we learned is, we could never do an Amazon HQ2 here. We don't have the workforce. We don't have the skilled workers. They're not available in, set in, in terms of skill sets. They're not available in terms of numbers. And when I talk to the major businesses in this city and they tell me time and time and time again that we have to do something to improve, improve our workforce because they can't find all the talent in this city that they need and they have to go outside of the city to recruit and how expensive that is and how burdensome it is. And it's led some to open offices in different places, yada, yada, yada. We really have to do something about it. There is no telling when we're going to have this opportunity again. I can tell you, you've never had the opportunity before. And I don't think it's going to come around again in the near future. For thousands of children who could benefit from this type of initiative, this is truly the fierce urgency of now. So we can choose to improve our outcomes for our children, which in turn strengthen our city, or we can live with the consequences. And I know we have the ability to do it because we've done it before. So we've chosen to take this important step. We've come together to move the city forward. We've done things like a transformative geo bond for infrastructure. We build housing. We've done our sewer lines and still working on those under a federal mandate. We constructed a streetcar that is recognized as the best system in the country. None of it is free. It's all free, rather. It allows people to get from place to place and move around this city in a way that they never could before. And we're going to extend it and allow more traffic. And it's created great economic opportunities and economic activity. We will have a new single terminal airport. Don't get all twisted by all the nonsense you read and see on the papers. Just remember there's six of 12 city council people running for mayor and they gotta have something to talk about. <laughs> pick, a, pick a controversy and ride that sucker all the way to uh, election day as your, your, pet, your pet project. But don't worry about it. Within a few weeks, you're going to hear about the reality of it. We've had civic and community leaders, parents, seniors, entrepreneurs, students, neighbors come together in all sorts of different ways to move this city forward. But we can't continue to leave so many people behind. So here's what we're going to do. Our plan is very simple, and it's not going to be cheap, and it's not necessarily going to be universally loved, but what can I tell you? About five years ago, KCPS commissioned a task force to look at early childhood education. Jerry Kitsey, their early childhood specialist, was involved. Herb Kahn was involved. A bunch of people were involved. They met down at the Kauffman Foundation on a, on a twice a month, I believe, looking at all sorts of different plans. And they kept coming to one very basic problem. Even if they came up with a plan, how were they going to fund it? And they were just talking about KCPS footprint. And they couldn't figure out how to fund it. So the idea was to do a property levy mill increase. But in order to do that and dedicate that money directly to pre-K, you had to have the charter schools sign off on it. Charter schools initially said yes, and then they said no. The legislature wouldn't move without the charter schools saying yes. So it stalled. A second attempt was made, and it stalled. So twice it's been tried, twice it's failed, and there hasn't been an attempt since. So about a year or so ago, another group of people came together under the auspices of the chamber after we asked, turned the page, asked the chamber to pick up early childhood education and kindergarten readiness as a, um, uh, a big five idea after they finished with the animal health big five idea. 
and they they only had four, so they needed a fifth. We said, make this your fifth, and they did. And they brought together, they formed a committee with the superintendents, and I don't know what happened there. I wasn't involved in any of those meetings, but we also formed a working group consisting of providers and parents and educators, et cetera, to look at putting the plan together. And the way that that plan came together was is that that group traveled to other cities where they're doing exactly what we're proposing here. Denver, Seattle, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Boston, Washington, New York, Minneapolis, San Antonio, Tulsa, some others that I've probably forgotten, have all been engaged in early pre-K, quality pre-K learning systems of one sort or another. We're probably most closely aligned to the Denver model. Denver is a sales tax based pre-K that will that has been in existence now for over 10 years. They've had their second vote. It passed by a higher margin the first the second time than it did the first time. And now they're looking at the very early stages of whether or not they can extend their four-year-old program down to three-year-olds. Very ambitious. But the results have been fantastic. And although they face resistance at the beginning, surprise, once it was done, people love it. And their kids have access to high quality pre-K and the results are pretty, pretty good in terms of academic performance and in terms of social activity. That's what we're proposing here. I would urge you if you have the time and inclination to go to my webpage, caseymayor.org and right there on the front page is the pre-K implementation plan. It's a, it's a long plan, 68 pages or so, but a lot of it is pictures and charts. And it will tell you exactly what we're doing. And the way that we would do this is to collect the funds and through a sliding scale based on the poverty of the parent and the quality of the education of the pre-K program there would be a tuition discount paid directly to the provider. And we need those providers to be the current providers, which consist of religious-based organizations like Emanuel Family Services and Swell Parkway, St. Mark's down on 12th Street, private commercial providers like Compass and all sorts of others, mom and pop providers that provide pre-K in the neighborhoods, and through a quality program, quality assistance program, and by spending some of those dollars for economic development, as which we have to do under the statute, raise up the quality and put more quality pre-Ks in more zip codes in areas of the city so that people would have accessibility and through the tuition discount method, lower the cost and make it more affordable. And it takes some time. Denver model showed that over 10 years, they reached the level of reaching 70, 75% of the kids. But you ramp it up just like you do anything else. First, we have to build up the quality and add more seats. Then the kids come. No sense in building a new car to ride on a road that doesn't exist. You build the road and then you put the car on it. And that's what we have to do. That's where I think is the most important thing that we can do as a city right now is to take care of our kids. And, you know, to be honest with you, I've got 192 days left. I could very easily have avoided this fight and let somebody else do it, but I can't do it. We've worked our entire eight years to make sure that we're doing the best that we can for our kids, to make sure that they're able to read, to give them the educational opportunities that are necessary to compete in an increasingly technological, complicated economy. And we've had some success, but we're getting to the game too late. I don't wanna come into the kitchen where the food is being made and only be there to sprinkle the seasoning on the top after it's all cooked. If we're gonna do this right, we need to be there when it's time to cook. And with our children, that means the earlier the better. And this is about as early as we can get right now, but I would think that even down the road, we need to be thinking about getting to pregnant families 
and talking about what's really out there and how to make sure that our children grow up right. So this is our home. It's up to us to make it as just and as equitable and as thriving as we possibly can. We are already a world-class city, but we are not in this area and we need to step up. And I know it's asking a lot. I know it's asking a lot. On the other hand, we have to make an investment in our kids or we're going to get, we're gonna spend the money. We're either gonna spend the money now and give them the options and the opportunity, or we're gonna spend the money on the back end and make sure that they have a nice cold prison cell. There is no productivity that comes out of prison cells. There are things that are productive and great to come out of children who have opportunity and hope. That's what we're asking you to do. I have not had an opportunity to explain this program. That would take more than an hour itself, but I'm going to be around in various places throughout the city. I already have been talking about this over and over again. We'll be, you'll be seeing a lot more information come out about it. The plan is on the website. Please take a look at it. But that's the fight. That's the last fight I've got. Don't need to fight about the airport anymore. It's already done. We're, we're there. We're getting there. Again, just remember the source <laughs> and the incentive. We've done some good things together in this city. And I couldn't be prouder of the people of this city for how we have supported those things that have made us stand out and how we have taken a big step up onto a big stage to which we really weren't on before. And we've had a lot of things come our way that have allowed us to do it. Google in 2011, streetcar, downtown hotel, but also other things that have happened, our boom in entrepreneurship. The fact that people look at this city now and want to be like Kansas City, where it used to be that we always wanted to be like St. Louis or Denver. Denver and St. Louis want to be like us. Thank you for that. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity, the honor and the privilege to be the mayor while we're getting these things done. Just one more job. Let's take care of our kids and get them into quality pre-K. Thank you. I'd like to ask the ushers to step forward for the collection. And I'll remind you again, if you have questions for Mayor James, please step up to the microphone. Uh, and while we're, while we're waiting for that, I'll announce that uh, next week we're expecting to have uh, Emily Liebla address us on the topic of a comprehensive plan to reverse climate change. Uh, again, um, please step up to the mic and the mayor will, will answer your questions. And maybe quite a few, so. Thank you so much for your vision for our city and our well being and all your wonderful service. Um, be kind of nice to have you <laughs> keep going, but that's another well, effort to be made. Well, that's absolutely true, and I don't think that you will find the seven votes on the city council. Uh, to change the charter when six of them are running for this job. So. Hello. <laughs> um, what's your feeling, and um, in this wonderful program, we're sure. really benefiting from kind of hearing more of a nuts and bolts about it um, to prepare us for the vote. Um, what's your feeling about the, the viability, uh, feasibility, and so forth of this program, Jackson County Cares? Is that something you're familiar with? Not really. Okay, well then I'll get out of your hair. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> Not really, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just you want to tell me what I'll it just, is? I'll just simply say, do you have some thoughts or feelings about what would be a good launch to improve our, to completely overhaul uh, our programs actually begin our programs for, for the elderly. Um, that's a, a huge, you know, it, we've got both ends, the, the kids and then later. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that I have any brilliant ideas, but I tell you one thing that I do know 
it starts with some sort of an organized approach to find out exactly what the issues are and then some sort of a systematic approach to figure it out. That starts with talking to people who are in that space, the elderly. It starts with looking at things like housing and accessibility. It starts with little things like whether or not you put door knobs or door handles on doors and how many steps there are, all sorts of things like that. Proximity. One of the major things that I think has an impact on, on um, elderly life is accessibility, easy accessibility to transportation. You've got to be able to get where you want. The, one of the things that scares me is the concept of growing to a point where I can no longer drive or get out when I want to and being dependent on somebody else to do that. I, I have a hard time doing that now um, uh, with asking people for, for help and I don't think I'm going to get any better. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, what we don't want are people feeling like they're trapped in their environment because they can't get out and do the things that they want. We need vitality. We need to make sure that our elderly are just as visible in our city as the millennials, the hipsters, and the Gen Xers, and all of those other things that I don't know what age groups they apply to. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Carol Coles. Um, I'm a member here, and I do volunteer in the Kansas City Public Schools. My question is, you've presented a plan that makes tremendous sense to me. Why has the Kansas City Public School District not embraced this plan? There, well, it's not just them. It's the superintendent's group, period. And I'm picking words, but in the meetings that we've had with them, there have been three, three and a half basic issues that have not been able to be overcome. Number one, they want to control the money. They want the money for themselves to figure out what to do with it. Number two, they want to control the process. Number three, they don't believe that money, public money, ought to go to uh, religious-based organizations or private organizations. It ought to only go to the public organizations, which means public schools. And number three, they're concerned about vouchers, okay? So I'll try to attack each of those separately. Uh, the tax dollars that would support this will not allow us to simply give the money to the school districts, and we shouldn't give the money strictly to the school districts. The school districts of the 35% of the kids that are in high-quality pre-K, school districts do not educate half of those kids. They're not, half of them aren't in that system. So they're not addressing the problem right now. They don't have the capacity to do it. They can't control the, the uh, process because if they're not going to share the funds with the private providers and the religious providers and the community-based providers, then the community-based private and religious groups will ultimately suffer from that because they'll suck all the four-year-olds out of the system, which is really kind of the profit level for um, pre-K institutions because of the higher cost of taking care of infants and two-year-olds and the, and the ratio of provider to child is so much higher and that's where all the cost is. So when you have the four-year-olds, when you don't need as much hands-on as a two-year-old, that's where you can make enough to offset the high cost. If they don't do that and they take the four-year-olds out, four out, one of two things is going to happen. Either the child care system as it currently exists for those under four will become much more expensive and be a weight on parents again, or it will simply collapse because they can't make enough money. This has to be done citywide. The main problem is, is that the method that the schools propose will not reach every child. Okay? They will not reach every child. And the only way that this is worth doing is to make sure that every child has the opportunity and access to these funds and the high quality pre-K. Or what we do is we're just simply adding steroids to a currently inequitable system that will continue to produce the current inequitable results. And, and the last thing I'll say, and I'll just say this, um, and I don't mean to be snide about it or anything else, but at the end of the day, where was all the conversation amongst the public schools and the school districts about this before? 
And if it was so important, why haven't they already done it? They're not. So at the end of the day, they recognize and they'll tell you, we believe this is an important thing to do. But we think that each and every district ought to have its own tax increase in its property mill levy to do it. And we know that's simply not going to work. So I'm not in favor of buying into things that are simply going to kick this can down the road more and more and more times than it needs to be kicked. It's time to do something about it. This is the only plan that's come up with any sort of a financing mechanism that works. And they're just not happy about it. But let me say this, too, in fairness to them, because when I talked to Julian Castro down in San Antonio when he was doing it, and as he, they've already done it, they had trouble with their superintendents, too. And what they did was they just said, the heck with it. They built their own pre-K systems, invited all the kids there, and then the superintendents got on board. When we were in Denver for the uh, leadership exchange, the superintendent of the Denver Unified School District said, don't let the school districts and the superintendents run this. Don't let them in it. That was from a superintendent. And I don't, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna criticize them. They do their job, they take care of our kids. But just because they run a school district does not necessarily mean that they are the ones who should be running this. They will not take care of the community-based, the private, and the religious-based organizations, which is where most of the kids are. And if they're not going to do that, then it's really kind of a non-starter. With regards to governance, we have a governance board that we've modeled and talked to them about extensively, and they wanted to have superintendents and school board members on it. We said, that's cool. So we created an additional six or seven spots on what was at that time, that time a 15 member board to give them more space so that they would have more voice. And that was not something that they wanted to do. So I've looked at it very simply. If you truly believe that this is something that needs to be done for the benefit of our kids in our city, we can find a way to work out those adult problems. But if you don't want to do it, you can find a thousand reasons not to. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, thank Hi. you for being here today. Um, I am a public school teacher. I teach high school reading and English. And my God bless you. freshman, thank you. <laughs> my freshman reading course is for struggling readers. It is a class within a class, um, which means I have special education students and gen ed students together and we co-teach it. And I have ninth graders in there reading at a third grade level, some reading at a seventh grade level. Um, so it's, it's a wide variety. It's certainly a challenge, but it is one of my favorite classes to teach because I love working on this skill with kids. Um, it does often feel like we're fighting a, a, a battle that we will lose right. because the kind of progress you can make once you hit that ninth grade level, I mean, it's, it's, it's harder to make progress. It's um, exceptional when you have a child that breaks through that barrier in a big way. You're just trying to get them up a couple of grade levels. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, trying to get them to grade level isn't really the goal. Bingo. It's, it's just, can you get them up a grade level, two grade levels? Can you take a, you know, second grade reading level and get them to fourth grade? Um, so I a hundred percent agree with you that this is the issue. This is what we need to be doing. So my question is, what can the average Kansas City and do to support this program? Because I think you are a hundred percent right. This is what we need to be doing. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much. I, I love teachers. I've gone. Uh, I made a promise when I started that uh, turned the page that I would try to go to every grade school in the city and read with kids. I'm up to about 125. I've got some more to go. I'm. We're, we're, we're trying to set a course to make sure that I get that done. But, and when I sit there, I've asked kindergarten teachers and third grade teachers, can you tell the children who had pre-K, quality pre-K from those who didn't, then they say within an hour, okay? It's kind of like, can you tell who's got on clothes and who doesn't? Yes, you can. I agree with you. What you can do, first, please read the plan. Second, we are going to be announcing some town halls. Come, because we're going to be out talking about it, and we will take all questions and all comers, and we will try to explain this and get this done. Third, once you are satisfied in your own mind 
that this pla that this plan has merit and that this is the right thing to do and this is the right investment, then we ask you to advocate for it with your friends and your neighbors. Fourth, vote. Absolutely vote. But if at any time you have a desire, you want to get some teachers together, I'll come talk or we'll get somebody if I can't make it. You, you want to just come to things? Go ahead. You want to call the office and talk to somebody? Call and talk to Julie Holland. She's our education advisor. Call and talk to me, whatever. We will do whatever we need to in order to make sure that people have as much information as they need in order to make this decision. Because I want the folks to come to this decision on their own. And it's a compelling argument. It really is. If we, you know firsthand what happens to children who are inadequately educated. When they come to you, by the time they get to you in high school, die is already cast in a lot of ways. And that's a sad thing. And you can probably look at some of those kids that are struggling with reading and see that they're struggling in other areas as well. Absolutely. Not just in the academics, but in getting along and socialization, because now they're at a disadvantage to their peers and they know it, they feel it. And there's always going to be a reaction to that. It may be drawing in or it may be aggressively acting out, but there's a reaction to being different than your peers in high school. We all know it. We all did it. When somebody was wearing those goofy bell bottoms, we all had to wear them. <laughs> well, those of us who were in that age group, probably not you. <laughs> but the plan is the first place to start. There will be a list of our town halls there as well. We'll be announcing more as we go forward. Please come and attend. Please call and ask questions. Whatever you need, we'll try to provide. Thank you very much. I'll be there. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi. Um, I'll try to make this succinct. You got on the wrong shirt, bro. Uh, oh, yeah. No, I was doing that. Ain't nobody at San Francisco is that way. I was doing laundry. I just didn't want to waste the stuff I was washing. So. Oh, okay. That's why it's too small. So you too. were washing all your red stuff today. Is that okay? Yeah, no, I got, I, got a chief, I got a chief sweatshirt for uh, for later. All right. That's good. But, uh, yeah. So uh, when I was growing up, I, I was part of, like, the early adoption, like, the Internet. And I was doing a lot of, like, early visual effects when I was like 13 or 14 and things like that. And just seeing all the kids from like Finland and the Netherlands and stuff like that, that had uh, more progressive education and things like that from early on, the already starting businesses at young ages and just having a lot of options. It was, uh, made me a lot, very jealous of, um, of just looking around at my peers and, and just being so behind and in their mentality of what they wanted to do with their life and their possibilities. So I'm, I super am passionate, even though uh, I don't want kids or anything, but I'm super passionate about like, what it means for the future. Um, but my question is, is around, you know, is, is this plan, I know a lot of it is how do we get the money to the providers that, you know, have researched and, and found are good, but is part of the plan also increasing uh, the accountability of the methods of teaching, like making sure that teachers know how gamification works right. to make sure that, that for those early de development that it's being taught the right way, or is it currently like, okay, we'll just research and these people have been, have been um, proven to be high quality, or is there like a, a process where you're making sure they are right. or, and trying to increase their effectiveness of teaching styles. Absolutely. Uh, that's the first step, frankly, is to increase the quality. There will be a uniform quality control system, quality evaluation system across the entire board. Uh, it will be for whoever offers pre uh, quality pre-K that wants to accept these dollars has to be involved in that quality. It will have, uh, and, and by that, what happens is, is that if you are at the lowest level of income and you send your, your child to the highest level of quality, then you will be perhaps eligible for a full tuition discount. The lower the quality, the less the discount. The higher the income and the lower the quality, the less the discount. So part of that quality is to have coaches available to go and meet with people who want to be involved in the system to evaluate their system and say, if you want to move to the next level of quality in our system, you need to get two more certified teachers and you need somebody here with a bachelor's degree. OK, or whatever the case may be, we'll help you do that because we can help provide funds for training. We can help provide some funds for bricks and mortar. But primarily, we want to make sure that you get people who actually have the skill sets that are necessary to engage in a quality pre-K program and, 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 and build that up. 
but we also want them to pay those people a wage that is better because what happens with Head Start, for example, they get they get somebody there who may or may not have a certificate and they're paying them eight or nine bucks an hour. And as soon as somebody comes along and offers 10, they're gone. So it's a churn. You need to pay quality well enough to keep quality. So that's part of the program as well. So yes, quality is definitely there, but we also have to have a, a DESE, Department of Edu Elementary and Secondary Education approved curriculum that is monitored. And as that program is being taught, there will be coaches that come and monitor the, that teaching, monitor those interactions with the children, give advice on how to improve or strokes for doing a good job. All of that is involved. With regards to Finland and those types of countries, there's a very big difference there. And I think that we need to be upfront about that difference. When you go to Finland, by and large, and until the recent immigration out of Africa and other subtropical areas where Not there's diverse. strife, you, pretty much everybody there is Finnish. Yeah. You know, you don't have a whole lot of segregation, a lot of small. issues. And it's small. Yeah. And they have a different focus, and they're not spending nearly as much on military and other things like that. We here have a whole lot of different folks. And our habit has been to segregate each other into different little pods and then to somehow manage to funnel resources to the pods that we want and not as much to the pods that we don't. So we get this uneven distribution, which causes ultimately a general and across the board drop in proficiency across the board. After World War II, the United States led the world in educational attainment. More people in secondary and college degrees than any place else in the world. Now I think we're like number 28 or 29. And we have not made the changes that are necessary. And if you look around, where are the cuts coming? The cuts are coming to higher education and all sorts of different things. And, and money comes out of education instead of goes into it. Plus, to be honest, our education industry is one of the most political entities in this entire country. If you think government's political, yeah. go spend some time in some college disagree. university systems. <laughs> and, uh, j you know, I, I totally agree with the difference of uh, socioeconomic differences in places. It was more of as an example of how it proves that the brain development is, an impact, is impactful. Look, here's the bottom yeah. line. We know. Yeah. We know what needs to be done in order to turn out better children. We simply do not have the political will and desire to do it. That's our problem. Now we have a chance to change that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. I think it's appropriate in this venue to ask particularly about parochial schools. Yes. And how the program will be carried out. Yes. Uh, I do know there are churches, uh, denominations with parochial schools that teach and preach values very different from ours. Yeah. Uh, LGBTQ messages, uh, sexist message, even sometimes racist messages. What kind of oversight would there be in this program so that three-year-olds are not see, being read stories, uh, see pictures on the wall, hear people talking uh, in about values that are contrary to my religious values? Well, I don't want to narrow it to your religious values. I think what we ought to talk about is making sure that they're not teaching things that are contrary to human values of one sort or another, and anger and hate in any form directed towards any group is ridiculous. But to answer your question directly, uh, first of all, absolute requirement that it's a non-sec, that it's a sec, non-secular, non-sectarian non curriculum. It has to be a DESI approved curriculum and it has to be coached and it has to be approved. Secondarily, there will be people in classrooms monitoring to make sure of what's being taught is being taught. Third, we're not really talking about the fringe. What we're talking about are things like St. Mark's. You have to have already an existing pre-K program. You can't create a program and then want to opt in here. The first criteria is, is that you're already operating an existing pre-K program. The governing board has the ability to say, nah, we don't want you, okay? So if the governing board, which will consist of school district people, uh, educators, parents, um, um, business people, all the people that are gonna be on there, look at this program and say, we don't like this message, we're not gonna certify you to be in the program. They don't get certified. 
It's just that simple. And they don't get the money. You say people will be in the classrooms. Do you mean on a daily basis or checking? No, nobody's going to be able to be there on a daily basis. Checking they'll some be there. They'll be there for spot checks yeah. and surprise visits, et cetera, et cetera, to enforce the quality control issues. I know, but and when you say anti-human messages, uh, I'm, I'm just concerned that we have – um, you know, the uh, I'm going to call it the far right religious conservative values believe what they're preaching is uh, the right message, God's message. And sometimes there's, you know, they'll protest. They're teaching a human message. I, I get it. I understand. Yeah. And like I said, the governing board has the ability and the authority to say, nah, we're not going to certify you. We don't like that message. And all members on the governing board are appointed, aren't they? Uh, they will be, at least yes. the initial okay. governing board. That's the only way to get them. Wait a minute. One minute for the final question. I'm concerned that the funding mechanism of sales tax is the most regressive and will sure. put the most burden on the poor. Sure. Well, you know what? You know what's the most regressive thing? Poverty. Poverty is a hell of a lot more regressive than a sales tax. And the problem is, whenever you talk to anybody about what are we going to do about poverty, what are we going to do about crime, one of the first things they say is education is one of the keys. And if we're not taking the steps to educate our kids, then we're not doing anything about poverty. If we don't do things differently, we're not going to be changing poverty. Poverty is not going to change one bit. And yes, it is regressive. It's always been regressive. Every sales tax is regressive. And we have lots of them. But at the end of the day, it, I'd rather have a regressive sales tax that's going to make sure that the children born in poverty have an opportunity to get out than to have a sales tax that doesn't do anything for the people who are there. You have to make an investment if you want to get a return. And right now, we're not getting any return. And that's where poverty lives, is in the dark. So last thing I'll say, because I was asked, people have asked me what I'm going to do. I'm not running for any more offices. I have zero desire to enter into partisan politics. I am not willing to sacrifice my uh, soul in order to occupy an office uh, where I would have to learn to knuckle point and make sure that my hair doesn't blow in a gale force wind. Um, I, I am so used. I have the best job in politics. I'm the mayor of a city. And that means that we actually do stuff. We don't talk. We don't argue about everything. We don't get involved in roadblocks and standoffs and long-term arguments. We do stuff. We build. We work with our kids. We work with our people. We supply money to people who need uh, medical care through our tax levies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't see any reason to take a step down. Um, I plan to stay right here in this city and work with uh, some people that, I'm, uh, that I know, my chief of staff, uh, and, and do some consulting on the issues that we care about and some speaking and advocacy on some of the issues that we care about, I'll spend more time with my family, and hopefully make a little more money than I'm making now. <laughs> Thank you all very much. We uh, always honor our guests with a uh, All Souls You You For a mug, uh, but I'm particularly pleased to give this the final one to our mayor. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you, Michael. One last time, uh, I have a great deal of respect for this man, not because of this, but because of all of the active uh, interactions I've had with him over the last 15 years or so. This is a man, when you talk about doing things in terms of equity, this is a man that walks that walk, not just talks to talk. So thank you. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. Please feel free to stay for the service. Thank you, brother. Appreciate okay. Uh, I think so. All right. Thank you. So, I'm for, I don't know who. Oh, hi. Hi. So, this.